Hello everyone! I was part of a group of YouTube atheists and an agnostic who collaborated to make a video regarding questions we were reasonably sure theists couldn't reasonably answer. Regardless, theists made a response, so this is my response to their response. Let's jump right in. The video I was a part of came from the Non Sequitur Show and is titled Questions No Christian Can Answer An Atheist Creators Collaboration. In it, a bunch of atheist content creators, all less popular than me of course, came up with questions we had about Christianity. Here's my question. Hello everyone! In the Old Testament, God didn't like all the unrighteous people on earth. So why did God choose to get rid of all of them with a global flood? Presumably, he could have made them painlessly vanish with a silent snap of his immaterial fingers. And why, after flooding the whole earth, did God decide to hide all evidence of his act? Following the video, a bunch of theists got together to come up with answers to our questions. I don't know how many people in total made responses to our questions, as the only answers I read came from the blog of Stephanie Thomason. Now, I thought my question was pretty simple. All the theist had to say was that the global flood story is just a metaphor for how people are judged for not abiding by the laws God laid out in the Bible, or something similar. And, to be fair, that's basically what Abraham's holy terror says. Secondly, J.J. Richards points out that there's evidence for the story being rooted in local flood events, which I agree with, and that no one really knows why God massacred almost the entire human race in the way that he did. Well, I guess my question really is one no Christian can answer. How about that? Thirdly, Andrew Stratolate's answer was hilarious. He says, quote, Because there is a more significant connection between the actions of the unrighteous and their fate than an arbitrary judgment on God's part. Oh, and he did leave evidence, otherwise you wouldn't be talking about it now. Close quote. This answer, I'm using the term loosely, seems to suggest that I can only talk about a subject if there's evidence to support it. So I have to ask, can we talk about the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl even though there's no evidence to support his existence? Andrew would likely reply, sure we can talk about the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl even though there's no evidence to support his existence. So I ask again, so you're saying that we can talk about the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl even though there's no evidence to support his existence. You get the point. His answer is so absurd that I don't honestly think it says what he meant it to say. Maybe Andrew meant to say that I'm asking about the global flood because I believe there's a lot of evidence supporting that it happened. I don't think it, there's any evidence supporting the existence of a global flood in the past. I'm trying to interpret his answer as charitably as I can. Fourthly, Philip Cotreau also tried sort of defending the flood. He starts, quote, I'm not surprised someone brought up the flood. That is the favorite topic of the non-believer, close quote. For one thing, I'm the only person of the 14 questioners who referenced the global flood, so I wouldn't say it's a favorite from that perspective. It's also not my favorite topic, which is evolution. Perhaps he means that non-believers talk about it a lot, which is true, but we talk about it because theists claim that it actually happened, which Philip does. He says, quote, I realize it might be a stretch getting you to accept a global flood, so I'm willing to meet you halfway. Close quote. Aside from the fact that I think that's a strange tactic to take, what evidence does Philip offer? Well, he says this, quote, there are over 250 flood legends from the ancient world, the oldest originating in Mesopotamia. Genesis is just one account, and not even the oldest. Almost all of them have the same basic story in common. The god or gods decide to destroy the world with a flood, but warn one righteous man to save his family and all the animals by building an ark. The ark is swept onto a mountain, while the rest of the world perishes, and the flood hero saves not only humanity, but becomes the inventor of wine. Close quote. Right, as far as I can tell, he's correct about the oldest flooding stories being from Mesopotamia, being written down in the Epic of Gilgamesh, a good book for anyone who hasn't read it. 
The story in that book is very similar to the Noachian Flood, so you can think of its flood hero, Utnapishtim, as something of an Assyrian Noah. Now, what about that claim that almost all the stories have the same basic plot? I don't know where that claim originated, but it's not anywhere near true. Sure, there are flood stories where one righteous man was warned of an impending flood, whether by a god or a fish or a goat or what have you. And some flood stories have arcs in them, or boats, or rafts, or giant gourds. However, the majority of stories don't follow this pattern. Want proof? See Talk Origins page, Flood Stories from Around the World. There is unimaginable diversity among the stories. Continuing on, Philip discusses flood sediments found in the Middle Eastern city Ur that seem to be that kernel of truth in the Noachian flood story. Sure, that could be the case. A local flood in Mesopotamia was aggrandized by storytellers into a global flood. All that provides evidence for, though, is a local flood, not a global flood. But Philip also says the Bible could be translated in such a way that it could mean local flood instead of a global flood. Since I'm no Hebrew scholar, I'll take his word for it. Philip also points out that the Ark didn't necessarily land on Mount Ararat, but on the mountains of Ararat, which is the modern Zagros mountain range. I didn't know this. Philip goes on, quote, According to ancient traditions, including even the Quran, a mountain 17 miles to the southwest of Ararat, called Judi Dog, is the real landing place of the Ark. And the archaeological evidence for this is overwhelming, close quote. Again, another piece of interesting information that I didn't know. So, is the archaeological evidence for the Ark overwhelming? Well, here's a fun fact. People have been finding Noah's Ark for years on Mount Ararat. But, wait, the Ark is supposed to be on Mount Judy. Oh, don't worry, people have found the Ark there too. People have even found the Ark in totally different mountain ranges in totally different countries such as Bob Cornuke having found the Ark in the Alborz Mountains in Iran instead of Turkey. People have also gone on expeditions to Ararat and Judy without ever having found the Ark at all. If that's what counts as overwhelming archaeological evidence, then color me unconvinced. It's a light shade of purple. Finally, Philip says, quote, I couldn't even list to you all the ancient sources that have reported the decaying remains of a giant wooden ship on the side of Mount Judy. Even Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, claimed to have seen it and even taken a piece with him to worship in the temple at Nineveh. There are even ancient tribes with legends of ascending the mountain and scraping bitumen, which is only produced in swampy lowlands, off the Ark ruins to make talismans. Close quote. Honestly, I wish he would have given me some modern sources instead that claim to have found the Ark. But what does Philip give me? Ancient Source X claims to have found the Ark. As neat as that is, it provides exactly zero evidence that the Ark was actually found by anyone. So, what evidence do we have that the flood recorded in Genesis happened as described? Well, we have some geological evidence that a normal flood occurred in Mesopotamia in the past, and there are a whole bunch of wildly different flood stories. We also have a number of varying claims of people having either found or not found the Ark, many of them in the same general area. All in all, there's no reason we should believe in the Ark story, and no one can answer my question of why God chose to flood humanity. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.